Good day. Today, 10th April, is another day in the special military operation that Russia is conducting on what is still recognized by most countries as the territory, the territory of Ukraine. The Russians, of course, have a different view. There is some fighting going on in Kharkiv region, which the Russians continue to recognize as Ukrainians. But it's important to remember, and it's a fact that far too many people overlook, that so far as the Russians are concerned, most of the fighting that is taking place, in fact, far and away, the greater part of the fighting that is taking place, the actual ground fighting, is happening in Russian territory. Since the decisions which were made in September um, 2022, um, the Russians regard the four regions, Donetsk, Lugansk, Zaporozhye and Kherson, as part of Russia, as, of course, they regard Crimea as part of Russia. So when we read about fighting in places like Chasov Yar, Krasnogorovka, Pervomaisky, eventually, no doubt, Vugledar and Siversk, um, Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, wherever, um, even Zaporozhye, which I'm starting to think will eventually become a proximate target for the Russians. Well, the Russians, of course, consider all of these places to be Russian territory, legally within Russia, the people who live in these places, Russian citizens, and they formally consider those Russian citizens in these places still under Ukrainian control to be Russians living under foreign occupation. Now that, of course, completely reverses Western understanding of, or at least reporting, of the fighting. But I have no doubt at all of the sincerity with which Russian officials and most Russian uh, citizens approach this, and certainly the Russian soldiers on the battlefronts. And um, it adds a certain quality to the fighting, which I don't think is properly or fully understood, at least in the West. Anyway, let's turn to what has actually been happening on the battlefronts, because there's actually been quite a lot of important and interesting news over the last 24 hours. The big event which took place um, yesterday though it has not yet been confirmed by the Russian Defense Ministry, is uh, that Pervomaisky, this uh, place southwest of Avdevka, has now fallen under Russian control. And there's pictures of the Russian soldiers raising their flag in the northwestern part of Pervomaisky. I think it is possible that there are still some Ukrainian troops uh, holding out in Pervomaisky. It's unlikely that Pervomaisky has been brought fully under Russian control. Usually it takes the Russian Defense Ministry a couple of days before they confirm its capture. But the overwhelming consensus is that Pervomaisky has indeed been captured by the Russians, even the deep state um, website and ma mapping um, company, which is uh, not only Ukrainian, but has some kind of relationship with the Ukrainian Defense Ministry, acknowledges this. So there is no doubt at all that Pervomaisky is under Russian control. And this is having an effect on the fighting um, to the west, and south of Pervomaisky, and as I have repeatedly said would happen, the fall of Pervomaisky is leading to a major intensification of Russian attacks on the uh, small town of Krasnogorovka to the south of Pervomaisky. Again, if you look at maps, 
and you look at the roads, it's clear that with Pervomaisky under Russian control, the days of Ukrainian control of Krasnogorovka are numbered. And in fact, over the course of the last 24 hours, there are reports of a major Russian breakthrough in Krasnogorovka. Now, these are not confirmed, and perhaps they should be taken with some caution, but there are reports that uh, the Russians have now fought their way through to the center of Krasnogorovka. If you look at some of the claims, perhaps a quarter or a third of Krasnogorovka has now um, fallen under Russian control. Maybe that's putting it too strongly. At least the Russians have established a presence in around a quarter to a third of Krasnogorovka. It's quite plausible that there are still Ukrainian troops um, in all parts of this area of Krasnogorovka, still resisting and still fighting. But the Russians are breaking through. There are lots and lots of pictures now of uh, Russian armoured units moving into Krasnogorovka. The town is being very heavily bombed by the Russians. And as I said previously with Pervomaisky under Russian control, the Russians are now in a strong position to interfere with Ukrainian communications. Um, reinforcements and supplies being sent to Krasnogorovka because it is an open route now for the Russians to advance to the roads, the supply roads, um, to the north and west of Krasnogorovka. And it is highly likely anyway that the Russians are able to shell and bomb Ukrainian troops moving along these roads. And with Pervomaisky under their control, um, that has now become much easier. So very intense fighting taking place in Krasnogorovka. Now, there are some who question whether as much of Krasnogorovka as some reports are claiming has indeed been occupied or passed under the control or entered by the Russians, whether the Russians really have reached the central part of this town. Um, and the short answer is, of course, that I don't know. Um, I am not physically present there, as I've said many times. I'm not in contact with the commanders in the area, Russian or Ukrainian. The Russian general staff and indeed the Ukrainian general staff don't brief me on what is going on in any particular location. I am entirely dependent, as most people are, on the information that comes trickling from the battlefields, which is filtered for us by the various um, telegram channels and uh, YouTube uh, videos like Slavyangrad and um, Deep State and um, the Military Summary Channel and all of these that and Ribar and Wargonzo that receive all of this information and which process it and which pass it to us. These are either directly in contact with the troops on the front lines or alternatively, if they are not, they're in contact with or are able to access information provided by um, parties which are. So the Russians giving us a very clear picture, the Russian side of this reporting world giving us a fairly consistent picture of the Russians having broken through to Krasnogorovka, but I can't obviously confirm definitely that that is the case. What I will say is this. The skeptics, those who doubt that the Russians can have advanced so fast within Krasnogorovka, I think are generally the people who assume that the previous claims made by the Ukrainians about a week ago 
um, that the Russians had been ousted entirely from Krasnogorovka. Um, anyway, the skeptics are those who give weight to those Ukrainian claims. Those of us, including myself, who think that more likely than not, the Russians have always maintained a presence in Krasnogorovka, that those Ukrainian claims to have pushed the Russians out of Krasnogorovka were probably um, exaggerated. Those of us who think that are more likely to accept that the Russians have advanced further from those positions that they already occupied, that they've clearly been significantly reinforced by troops pouring in from the south and the east of Krasnogorovka, and that it is more likely, therefore, that the Russians have indeed reached the central part of Krasnogorovka, as some of the reports claim. Well, we'll have to wait and see what the situation is. But to reiterate again, with Pervomaisky having fallen, the days of Krasnogorovka are numbered. I don't know how long it's going to take before the Russians finally capture Krasnogorovka, but the direction of travel is now certain. There is no conceivable way um, that the Ukrainians can retain control of Krasnogorovka unless they're able somehow to launch a general counteroffensive in the area, which I don't think anybody thinks remotely likely. And at some point within the next few weeks, probably, Krasnogorovka will have passed, passed for fully under Russian control. The more interesting question, maybe, beyond what is going on in Krasnogorovka, is what else are the Russians going to do in this general area? The area to the west of Avdeevka, which of course they captured in February. And there are reports that the Russians are now attacking the village of Nitailovo, which is to the west of Pervomaisky, and that they're also um, cutting the supply lines between Nitailovo and another village um, to the, which lies between Tylovo and Umanske further north, and that this entire defense line, in effect, that the Ukrainians hurriedly improvised after the fall of Toninka and Orlovka, um, villages further east, but west of Avdevka, that this hurriedly improvised defence line is also in the process of disintegrating. And again, I think that these reports almost certainly are true. In fact, there's reports of another big Russian armoured advance um, westwards towards um, in the area between Umansky and Natalovo. Um, which claims that this armoured advance, this armoured fist, has actually achieved um, its objectives. Well, who knows? But anyway, um, clearly fighting is taking place. All the indications are that the Russians are advancing, and it looks as if the Ukrainian defences around west of Avdeevka are continuing to crack. And, well... We'll see what the Russians decide to do. Now, in my program yesterday, I discussed further news about a major Russian advance that appeared to have happened at some point, some unknown point over the previous days, north of the other Krasnogorovka. This is a village to the north of Avdevka, the town of Krasnogorovka that I was previously talking about is located to the south of Avdevka. As I said, it is very confusing that in this part of the world there are many places which have identical names. But anyway, um, 
there was a lot of reports about a major Russian advance uh, from Krasnogorovka, the other Krasnogorovka, towards Keramik, um, a small town to the north of this area, and of the Russians outflanking Ocheretino on the railway lines. Um, as so often happens, we have an awful lot of news about this um, advance, which has been confirmed, by the way. There is an awful lot of news, which happened in a very concentrated period of a few hours. Nobody previously had known that this advance had happened. Then the Ukrainians counterattacked, apparently unsuccessfully. Lots of reports that um, connected to that Ukrainian counterattack to try to throw back this Russian advance. The Ukrainian counterattack appears to have been defeated. And then again, radio silence descends. So we don't know, at least I don't know, exactly what is happening in this area. Um, all the indications are that this is an important advance, that the Russians are focusing large resources to uh, achieving it. And no doubt at some point we will find out. But it is, again, indicative of the extent of Russian operations that we see fighting taking place to the south of Avdevka, between Avdevka and Marinka, with this intense battle for Krasnogorovka taking place. We see fighting taking place to the west of Avdevka, with the Russians having in rapid succession, relatively rapid succession. Remember, um, Avdevka itself only fell in February. The Russians having captured first Lastochkino, then Toninka and Orlovka, now um, Pervomaisky, then pushing on and uh, probably within the next few days taking Netailovo and Omanske and the other village between these two. Um, so, and of course, on top of that, a further Russian advance northwards toward, from the other Krasnogorovka towards Keramik. Now, this is clearly a major center of Russian military operations. Um, intense fighting going on around this area. Um, the Russians committing significant resources, men and armor. The Russian general in overall command is General Modvichev, who is now by universal acknowledgement um, one of the most talented Russian commanders that this conflict has thrown up. Um, he is perhaps as well known to the Russian public as the other successful Russian battlefield commander, um, General Teplinsky, who is, um, for the moment, operating things in Kherson and Zaporozhye region. Anyway, um, Mordvichev's troops are now attacking in three directions. As I said, the Ukrainians continue to put up significant resistance. But nonetheless, the Russians continuing to break through. So that's one big area of fighting that is continuing to take place. It would be very interesting to know how many troops the Russians have committed to the fighting in this area. Um, how many troops the Ukrainians have, but of course, nobody's giving us the exact numbers. And of course, that's the fighting in this, in the what might be called the Marinka Avdevka area of the battlefronts. Very intense, very um, important, I suspect. Perhaps this is where the main Russian advance will come. But also we're getting lots of reports about the continued Russian advance in the Bakhmut area with the continuing fighting in Chasov Yar. Now, yesterday I said that there were lots of reports about Bogdanovka, the village to the northwest of Chasov Yar, having fallen under Russian control. Again, it's likely that there are Ukrainian troops still in Bogdanovka in some places. 
and that a clear up operation there continues. Again, we've had no confirmation from the Russian Defense Ministry that Bogdanovka has actually fallen to the Russians, but it would be surprising given um, the information we've been receiving from many quarters if that were not actually effectively the case. There's been more reports of Russian troops breaking in um, to breaking into this hill area to the north of Chasov Yar. Again, no confirmation of this, but plausible and likely, but in any, in any event, no doubt at all about intense fighting going on in and around Chasov Yar. And lots of reports that the other big advance by the Russians towards Chasov Yar, this one from the south east um, from Ivanivska, the village the Russians captured about two weeks ago, the village they call Krasnoye. Anyway, that advance apparently is now um, moving relatively fast. The Russians from that part of from that part of that third prong of their advance um, seem to be um, now approaching the Chasov Yar Canal from the south. They're close to cutting all the roads. And the roads I mean here are the ones that would provide the last connections between the Ukrainian forces still clinging on in the micro district of Chasov Yar, east of the canal, to the Ukrainian forces still located around Klesheevka and Andreevka, further to the south. And the German journalist Julian Röpke, uh, he writes for Bild Zeitung, German tabloid. He is an ardent, fervent supporter of Ukraine, but can sometimes be quite an insightful um, and interesting commentator about the state of the fighting. Anyway, he says that the pattern of Russian storm, stormings of towns is repeating itself. Multi-pronged attacks on towns. The Russians attacking Chasov Yar from the east, from the northeast, and soon they will be attacking Chasov Yar from the southwest as well. And I think it is now generally acknowledged that the Chasov Yar Canal is not a significant obstacle. Of course, I haven't seen pictures of it. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know how wide it is. But apparently it is not particularly difficult to cross. Perhaps the Russian troops can wade across it and the armour can cross it also. I mean, again, I simply don't know. But... One way or the other, it looks likely that the Russians are aiming not just to capture the micro district to the east of the canal, but the whole of Chasov Yar. And significantly, they have now started bombing Konstantinovka, the town to the west of Chasov Yar, to which it seems the Ukrainians have now withdrawn their headquarters, the headquarters that they previously had in Chasov Yar itself. Now, Konstantinovka is a much bigger place than Chasov Yar. Chasov Yar has a population, or had a population, before the war of around 12,000 people. Allegedly, there's around 900 of them still in the town, which seems incredible, but they're still there. Um, Konstantinovka, before the war had a population of 67,000. So this is a town roughly of the same dimensions as Bakhmut. But of course, unlike Bakhmut, it is not surrounded by a ring of protective villages. And of course, and if Chasov Yar is captured by the Russians, then it seems that Chasov Yar is the high ground and Konstantinovka is the low ground. And 
it would be much more vulnerable to um, capture than Bakhmut was during the intense fighting that took place last year. It's also, of course, the case that the Russians are now much more powerful than they were this time last year, whereas the Ukrainians are not only weaker, their army is probably smaller than it was this time last year. They're short of ammunition and equipment in general, and this is hardly disputed. Um, and, of course, unlike the situation during the fighting in Bakhmut last year, the Ukrainians are under pressure right across the front lines. So they have far fewer reserves that they can redeploy to defend a place like Konstantinivka than they had reserves to defend Bakhmut this time last year. And perhaps a sign of how bad the manpower situation in the Ukrainian military has become is that we've now had confirmation that General Sirsky has in effect countermanded the um, decision, the previous decision, which President Zelensky had made and which the Ukrainian parliament had been moving towards approving, which was to actually demobilize some Ukrainian soldiers who had been fighting in Ukrainian military units ever since the start of the special military operation in 2022. There has been many calls from within Ukrainian society for these troops to be demobilized, but in a situation of increasingly dangerous manpower shortages, with some Ukrainian officers talking about Ukrainian units operating at no more than 40% strength, Sirsky has had to do the unpopular but necessary thing of countermanding that decision. Of course, there is still the ongoing bill to mobilize more troops supposedly passing through the Ukrainian parliament. That bill seems to be taking forever to work its way through. Allegedly, it has been subjected to 4,000 amendments or attempted amendments. And even General Sirsky has acknowledged that it is not going to provide with the, Ukra the Ukrainian military with a half a million men that we were told in the autumn of last year that Ukraine needed. Um, Sirsky says that after a careful audit, which we can take with a massive pinch of salt, the true number of men that Ukraine actually needs will be far less than this, which is, of course, an admission that the mobilization plan has effectively, already effectively failed. So anyway, there we are. We have a situation where um, Ukraine, short of men, unlikely to be able to defend Konstantinovka if Chasovya falls. And there are now starting to be reasons for thinking that Chasovya might actually fall rather more quickly than we had initially supposed. Firstly, there's no doubt that the Russians have been fighting in Chasovya. There are lots of reports. In fact, I'm receiving reports. I've seen reports almost every hour about how the Russians are supposedly expanding their control of the micro district. Some of these reports are probably exaggerated. The micro district is, as I said, relatively small. If all of these reports were true, it would be surprising if there was any part of the micro district by now still under Ukrainian control. But anyway, the Russians are fighting inside Chasovya. They are also building up their forces on the flanks. Um, once the micro district falls, they will be able they will be able to advance on Chasovya, the main part of Chasovya, beyond the canal from the east, and 
they're now strongly embedded in the north. And as I've said already, um, the advance from Ivanivska shows that they will be in a position before long <coughs> to attack Chasofia also from the south and west. Um, there are lots of reports that the Russians are able to shell and bomb and operate drones over the roads, the supply roads leading into Chasofia. The troops, the Russian troops are advancing from the north east, seem to be poised to start cutting some of these roads leading into Chasofia anyway. But perhaps the most, dramatic, most <coughs> compelling reason for thinking that Chasofia, the defences there, are crumbling fast <coughs> comes from a video that I saw yesterday. Now, I've seen some suggestions that this video is fake. I don't think it is. I don't really see why it would be fake, actually. But what it shows is two Suhoi 25 ground attack aircraft, Russian ground attack aircraft, flying over Chasofya, um, carrying out manoeuvres over Chasofya, um, presumed dropping flares and perhaps bombs, presumably on Ukrainian positions in Chastafia. And, well, it's astonishing at what low altitudes they're operating. Um, low enough so that one can see them distinctly. And there is no sign of any air defence operating over Chastafia at all. Not even man pads not even heavy caliber machine guns, not even, and certainly not uh, the more potent surface to air missiles, the books, the Iris T's, <laughs> those sort of things that you would expect the Ukrainians to be operating close to the front lines. And that suggests a disintegrating defense situation. It suggests that Ukrainian air defences have been effectively suppressed. And I would have thought that with the Russian Air Force now able to operate above Chasofya in this incredibly threatening way, without apparently encountering any resistance at all, um, that in itself suggests that the situation in Chasofya is now numbered. So, um, Chasofya likely to fall. Again, I'm not going to predict exactly when that is going to happen. But as with Krasnogorovka, the direction of travel is clear. Soon we will see Chasofya fall. The Battle of Konstantinovka will begin. Um, Konstantinovka, bigger place, but unlikely to be very defendable either, and the Russians likely to capture Konstantinovka, I would have thought, in reasonably short order. So, to reiterate again, this is the area of the main battle. Chasofya, Bakhmut in other words, the Bakhmut and Avdevka directions. There's an area between the area of New York, Toretsk, all of these places, which the Russians have chosen not to attack for the moment. Most probably they feel that if the defences in Bakhmut, the Ukrainian defences in Bakhmut and to the west of Avdevka, finally and irretrievably collapse, the situation in Toretsk and New York, <laughs> all those places, can be left to sort itself out the Ukrainian troops there would either have to retreat or, as I discussed in my program yesterday, um, face being completely trapped, sealed inside a cauldron. And one would presume that that is not what the Ukrainians would want to see. But anyway, one way or the other, um, this is the main, these are the two main focus of the Russian offensive. And I think it's reasonable now 
to speak of a Russian offensive. Not a word that the Russians themselves are using to describe current operations on the battlefronts. But it's clear to me that we're moving beyond mere aggressive attrition in the Avdevka and Bakhmut areas. We are seeing planned advances, plans to recapture territory and advance westwards. Though always the priority continues to be the destruction of the Ukrainian military and always within that objective, the further objective also exists of capturing Ukrainian strong points and positions, opening up the way for a potential advance towards the Dnieper, which, to reiterate again, and I understand that people find this difficult to understand, but to repeat again, if the Russians reach the Dnieper in central Ukraine, the war, the Ukraine war, is, from a Russian point of view, essentially won. From a Ukrainian point of view, it is irretrievably lost. And I've explained the economic, geographical reasons for that in many programs, and I'm not going to repeat it now. So, lots going on on that part of the battlefront. Now, on those two key parts of the battlefronts. Now, there is an awful lot of further news from other places. As I said, the Russians continuing to put pressure on the Ukrainians in many places. There were lots of reports, for example, that the Russians are now close to the capturing Belogorovka, uh, this village, northern Lugansk region, last remaining part of Lugansk region, a place on the way to Siversk. And yesterday I said that the Russians had apparently managed to um, capture at least a part of the chalk quarry <laughs> um, to the east of Belogorovka. Some claims yesterday that they've captured the entire chalk quarry. No proof of this for the moment, but there is no doubt that they are present in the chalk quarry and that they are advancing um, both in the chalk quarry and around it, and the Ukrainians don't seem to be in a position to launch counterattacks in this area. So um, it looks as if the Russians are in the process of capturing Belogorovka, and there are also reports that the Russians are now successfully pushing up the railways from the south, that they are close to approaching this village of Vimka, which is to the south of Siversk. There's apparently an important railway station there. Um, that the objective, the immediate objective of the Russians is to capture this railway station and then use it as a base for a further advance on Siversk itself. There are also reports that the Russians are now located around Razdolovka, another village to the south, somewhat to the southwest of Siversk, that they might be preparing to attack there also. There are some very interesting and rather intriguing reports that the Russians have now entered at least some of the, or at least reached some of the outlying buildings of Urozhainia, one of these two villages, Staromayorsk and Urozhainia, that the Ukrainians struggled ferociously to capture during the summer um, offensive, Ukraine summer offensive last year. Um, the Ukrainian plan being, as I so well remember, to capture these two villages, the break on, advance further, um, to the southwest, eventually retaking, recapturing from the Russians the town of Volnovakha and ultimately Mariupol on the Sea of Azov. This is supposed to be one of the two prongs 
of the Ukrainian advance. The main one was from Orekhov through Rabotino to Tomcat, Tom, Tom, um, Tomak, um, beyond that to Mil Milotopol, and then on to the Sea of Azov. And the other was this advance through the Vrem of Kassalian, through these villages, on, through these villages towards Volnovacha and Mariupol, and also towards the Sea of Azov. Well, after intense, appalling battles, the Ukrainians battled their way through to these two villages, Urajina and Staromayorsk. There were all kinds of euphoric claims. I remember in August, when the Ukrainians finally said that they'd captured these villages, I remember reading rather horrifying accounts in the media at the time, Western media at the time, from Ukrainian soldiers describing how impossibly difficult the battles had been. <laughs> there were a few concerns squirreled away that, um, in some of these articles that even if the Ukrainians were able to consolidate control of those villages, there were, I seem to remember, something like 20 other villages like that that they would have to capture before they finally reached Mariupol. But the fact is they never did. They never advanced beyond those two villages. And now it seems as if the Russians are returning and are preparing to take control of these villages again. Or at least that's how it appears. It may be that taking their cue from what's going on in Robotino, what the Russians are going to do, again, is play their usual game of cat and mouse with the Ukrainians, lure the Ukrainians into reinforcing their positions in the Vremevka salient in order to try to cling on to their positions in these two villages, um, reinforce what is a marginal theater, an irrelevant theater, even as the main blow comes elsewhere in central Donbass. And I suspect that this is the story in Terni, for example, which people are still writing about. Um, and I suspect it's also, to some extent still, the situation around Siversk. I will say this. I do think that, and I've said this already in previous programs, once the Russians complete their clearing operation in central Donbass, once places like Konstantinovka and um, Krasnogorovka and um, Natalovo and Korakovo, once all of these places finally fall under Russian control, then the Russians will probably, before they do launch their advance towards the Dnieper, they will want to sort out the situation on their flanks. At that point, the battles for Siversk and in the north and Vugledar in the south will begin in earnest. There's more reports today, by the way, that the Russians have quietly captured another part of what's left of the village of Novomikhailovka that the Ukrainians have been clinging on to, despite the fact that their position there is untenable. Anyway, um, that the Russians have quietly captured more of Novomikhailovka over, over the last couple of days. Um, Ukrainian positions now very reduced in this village, which it's not even clear to me why the Ukrainians continue to defend it at all. But anyway, never mind. Um, but to reiterate again, I think that from a Russian point of view, Siversk, Vugledar, Terni, Kupians can wait the priority now, as is clear from where the Russians are most active, is central Donbass. 
Now, there's been more and more articles about the increasing activity of the Russian Air Force. The, there were reports yesterday, for example, that in an area somewhat behind the front lines, the Russian Air Force had been incredibly active bombing Ukrainian positions. I have to say that there is no indication of this in the Russian Defense Ministry's report um, that um, came out yesterday evening. But anyway, there were reports of intense Russian bombing of Ukrainian positions. And though I'm not going to recite the numbers again, the one thing that the Russian Defense Ministry report does again show is large numbers of Ukrainian artillery pieces being destroyed and continued destruction of, by the Russians of Ukrainian counter-battery radars, the ones principally that the United States has provided. The Russians are also, it seems, um, systematically destroying now uh, Ukrainian air defense radars across Ukraine. And we saw how in Chasofya there are no air defenses operating to speak of. More astonishing, perhaps, is that Kharkiv, which is now under constant air attack by the Russians and missile attack, and where electric power is now becoming increasingly sporadic. Well, Kharkiv seems to have no air defenses operating either. Um, in fact, the situation in that city is becoming desperate and it could be that there will be a Russian offensive focused upon it. But anyway, the Russian Air Force is very active. Russian missile forces are very active as well. And it's been interesting to note increasing Russian use of surface-to-surface -surface ballistic missiles. They are invariably described by the Russians as Iskander-M missile strikes. The Russians um, have recently said that they have greatly increased production of Iskander-M missiles, all very likely true. But I did see one report, one claim, that some of these missiles are, in fact, North Korean. Who knows? Um, I've seen no evidence to confirm that, and that as a result of these missile strikes, um, the North Koreans have learned an awful lot about how to operate missiles in battle and how their missiles uh, actually work in battlefield conditions, and that this will enable the North Koreans to enhance and update still further their missiles. So anyway, that is where we are on the battlefronts. Um, um, a deteriorating picture. The Ukrainians have recently started a major campaign to try to get air defense missiles from the West. And it's interesting how ammunition is suddenly become less of the hot topic of Ukrainian pleas. That's not to say that the situation with ammunition, artillery ammunition, is any better than it was. The indications are, on the contrary, that it is deteriorating. But with the Russian Air Force and the Russian Missile Forces now operating all across the battlefronts, and in the case of the Missile and Drone Forces, right across Ukraine every single night, and Russian aircraft, the Sukhoi 25s, flying over Chasofya, for example, in broad daylight at low altitudes. Well, it's perhaps unsurprising that the Ukrainians are now pleading for air defense missiles. And no less a person than Annalina Baerbock has been obliged to tell the Ukrainians that they have no, Germany has no Patriot air defense missile systems to spare. 
that stocks of them have been exhausted. Um, other European officials have trolled the Ukrainians that um, there simply are no more Patriot systems and air defense missile systems to spare. There's supposedly Germany is going on a hunt around the world for Patriot missile systems. Um, Yelen Zelensky recently made a fantastic demand for as many as 25 full brigades of Patriot missile systems. And I pointed out that that would be at least double. Well, it mean, would we'd be, well, not double, it would be more than the total stock of Patriot missile systems that we know about in the world. Um, his foreign minister, Dimitro Kuleba, has now come forward and said that actually Ukraine would be satisfied with just seven Patriot missile launchers, which would perhaps roughly replace Ukrainian losses of Patriot missile launchers um, since the start of the year, just saying. But the reality is, even that number of launchers would probably be difficult to find for Ukraine. And besides, with the Russians now operating right across the Ukraine in overwhelming force, with the Russians rolling out um, hypersonic missiles, Kinjals and Zircons, which the Patriot cannot intercept, with the Russians destroying ground radar systems. Even if these Patriot missile systems could be found, the only result, logically, is that the Ukrainians will soon lose them because the Russians will destroy them. So another exercise, or so it seems to me, in essential futility. Well, what are the Western powers going to do in this situation? Where, well, the French news agents, uh, the French newspaper, Le Monde, is telling us that um, President Macron apparently intends to deploy the 126th Infantry Regiment of the French Army to Odessa. This is a storied unit of the French Army created by Napoleon in 1810. Apparently it participated in his rather disastrous invasion of Russia, which we all know about. But nonetheless, uh, President Macron is apparently thinking of deploying it in Odessa. What can it possibly do there? How is he going to be able to change the situation? The, the Russians have already made it perfectly clear that if the 126th Regiment or any French troops at all enter Ukraine, the Russians will see them as targets and will attack them. So that's anyway one plan. I have discussed President Macron's um, crazy ideas reckless and extremely dangerous ideas of sending NATO troops, European troops, to Ukraine. I pointed out that his assurances that if the French get into trouble in Ukraine, France will not expect its NATO allies, specifically the United States, to come to its rescue. I've already explained that that assurance is worthless. And there is no doubt in that situation that he will indeed ask the Americans to come to his rescue. And that is why he wants to deploy French troops to Ukraine. He thinks that he can lure the Americans into a conflict with Russia over Ukraine. And in fact, those of you who follow the Duran will have seen a program that we did Yesterday, Alex Christoforo and I, with an extraordinarily insightful and experienced guest, Ray McGovern, a former top CIA analyst, person who used to study Russian affairs, Soviet affairs during the Cold War, a 
the man who, in the 1960s, tried to alert the US government to the fact that the Soviets and the Chinese were quarreling rather than in being in alliance with each other, the man who's been trying to get the government in the United States to understand today that, on the contrary, China and Russia are engaging in a rapprochement. I will come to that shortly. Anyway, um, Ray McGovern also feels, and his experience in this field is immense, and what he says should be taken very seriously indeed. Anyway, Ray McGovern says that it is indeed the case that President Macron is hoping to lure the Americans into some kind of confrontation with Russia over Ukraine, and that the United States, the US government, ought to be aware of the fact and ought to be alerted to the enormous dangers in, uh, in giving the green light to President Macron and what he appears to be doing. But to reiterate, even if there might be some people in the US government, including perhaps the president, who might be inclined to come to Macron's rescue if he does get himself involved in a mess in Ukraine, it might be a better idea for Macron and his British allies to take a step back and to realize that others in the United States, powerful forces in the United States, most emphatically do not want to become dragged into a conflict in Ukraine, and that whatever calculations Macron and his British friends are making, the opposition to the United States being dragged into a conflict in Ukraine is immense and could quite possibly prove to be insurmountable. We had some indication of this from certain comments made by none other than the US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. He has again come out and said that Ukraine should stop, should cease its attacks on Russian oil refineries. He says that launching these attacks, and he said this, by the way, in testimony to the US Senate, he said launching these attacks, all that it does is that it might cause increases in energy prices, which is, of course, not in the interest of the United States, and that the Ukrainians, rather than waste time and resources on these attacks, which are counterproductive, increases in energy prices only work to the Russian advantage. Anyway, the Ukrainians ought to be focusing instead on using their drones to attack military operational targets of the Russian militaries. So anyway, we see there from Lloyd Austin a certain lack of enthusiasm for the actions that the Ukrainians are taking. He did come in, by the way, for some criticism with these comments from people like Senator Carton, who is, of course, an extreme hardliner on all of these questions, and who clearly wants the Ukrainians to be given a free hand to attack anything, anywhere that they choose, but anyway. But much more significant is what has happened to the US, to the British Foreign Secretary, David Cameron. I said in my program yesterday that I thought that David Cameron's attempt to go to the United States to win the Republicans round to authorizing further funding for Ukraine was misconceived and would backfire, and so it has proved. There are now articles in the British media, including a long one in The Guardian, about the fact that the meeting between Cameron and Trump Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago went extremely badly. Apparently, Trump, who has no reason to feel <laughs> kindly towards the British anyway for all sorts of reasons, and especially one senses towards someone like Cameron, 
Anyway, Donald Trump apparently was completely unresponsive to um, what David Cameron was trying to tell him on Ukraine. But that was not the worst of it. Because David Cameron then went off to Washington in order to meet with Speaker Mike Johnson. Except that Speaker Johnson refused to see him. In other words, the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, once one of the most powerful countries in the world, the country that likes to believe itself the most important and powerful and loyal of America's allies, has been shown the door. Um, there are relatively few articles about this in the British media this morning, but those that do exist, you can sense the sense of recriminations and hand-wringing uh, which is going on. Um, there are some observations that Cameron was most unwise to insert himself into a re Republican argument, quarrel, about uh, funding for Ukraine. There are, of course, continued advocates within the Republican Party of funding for Ukraine. Um, people like Senator McConnell and presumably Senator Cotton and others like that. But increasingly, there is now what one senses is an ever stronger faction within the Republican Party which opposes it. Recently, Marjorie Taylor Greene, outspoken um, Republican in the House of Representatives, clearly a rising star within the Republican Party. And if I may say, I mean, in some ways, a flamboyant but impressive politician. I say that, that's not an endorsement of any kind. She's an American um, politician. I don't endorse any American politicians. And I don't know a huge amount about Marjorie Taylor Greene, but certainly she's articulate and outspoken, and I suspect speaks for many people in the Republican base. Anyway, she's come out very strongly against any wobbling by Senator uh, Speaker Johnson on this issue. She's given dark hints that Speaker Johnson is being blackmailed. I have no reason to think that, by the way, but who knows? Anyway, that's what she says. And she's dropped very heavy hints that if Speaker Johnson does go ahead and um, put a, a package of funding for Ukraine to the vote in the House of Representatives, well, then his days as Speaker are numbered the hardline faction of which Marjorie Taylor Greene is one, will then move to oust him as Speaker as they moved some months ago to oust Speaker McCarthy. So, just saying, an intense battle going on within the House of Representatives. The latest report suggests that Speaker Johnson is again cooling on the idea of an appropriations bill for aid for Ukraine, perhaps in the face of threats from the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene. And one way or the other, I think that it was ludicrously unwise, indeed absurd, for David Cameron to insert himself into this. David Cameron meeting Mike Johnson, persuading Mike Johnson, as he presumably thought he might do, to back funding for Ukraine, all that that was likely to do was incense House Republicans even further. I think some people in Britain don't understand <laughs> the complicated feelings many Americans actually have about Britain. Just saying. <laughs> but anyway, I think that it would have been a disastrous look for Speaker Johnson. And it is entirely unsurprising that Speaker Johnson decided that he couldn't risk 
a meeting with David Cameron. Now, all I'm saying is if Johnson isn't prepared to meet with Cameron, if um, the meeting between Cameron and Donald Trump didn't go well, then how will the Republican Party as a whole, how will the Republican electorate across the United States respond if the French and the British go on an adventure in Ukraine, get smashed up by the Russians, and come begging to the Americans for help. I would have thought extremely negatively. And in an election year, when the sentiment of most people in the United States seems to be cooling on support for Ukraine, I think that the Biden administration might find it very difficult to get authorization from Congress to permit some kind of military action in Ukraine. And I have to say, I think that without that authorization from Congress, I think that even the Biden administration would be reluctant to move forward. So I think that Macron and the British need to take a step back and need to look at the situation in the United States clearly and with open eyes and understand that things there are not as easy as they appear to believe. Well, even as we have all this confusion and muddle and chaos in the West, the Chinese and the Russians are meeting. And I think the first thing I'm going to say is that one of the most interesting facts about the last few weeks is the extent to which Beijing has now become the world capital of international diplomacy. We have had visits to Beijing by Secretary, Yell uh, by Secretary Yellen. Secretary Blinken is apparently also on the way. President Biden wanted to speak to Xi Jinping, and of course there was this rather edgy and difficult conversation between them. Olaf Scholz is also apparently on his way with a big delegation as well. And along the way, the Chinese have also been hosting Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. And Lavrov confirmed, it was confirmed in the Chinese media, and by the way, the Russian media, that one of the purposes of Lavrov's visit is to prepare the ground for a forthcoming visit this year to Beijing by no less a person than President Putin of Russia. And there are reports, rumors in places like Reuters, which may be true, by the way, that Putin is going to be heading to Beijing within a few weeks' time, sometime in May, to be precise. Presumably, directly after the Easter holiday and the May 9th Victory Day celebrations. So that looks like an important visit. Now, Lavrov, who is Russia's foreign minister, has had meetings in Beijing with China's foreign minister and foreign policy veteran Wang Yi, who is, of course, also a member of the Chinese Poli Communist Party's Politburo. And he's had, which is unusual, a meeting also with Xi Jinping. Now, the Russians have provided um, um, readouts, or at least summaries of the discussions that took place between Lavrov and Wang Yi and Xi Jinping during this visit. I have not yet seen English language readouts provided by the Chinese Foreign Ministry. What, was, what I found interesting was that um, at the same time, as uh, Lavrov met with Wang Yi and met with Xi Jinping, he also had a he also had a press conference with Wang Yi present, and um, 
press conferences, joint press conferences, are often a sign that, well, are nearly always a sign of particular friendship between two countries. Now, the Russians have provided the text of Lavrov's comments over the course of the press conference, as is as they usually do, they have not provided a transcript of Wang Yi's words. And this is understandable. The Russians will not want to translate Wang Yi's words for him. That they would that they're going to leave to the Chinese Foreign Ministry to do. But I did notice this question and answer, and I thought it was an interesting one. It's, it was a question that came from a journalist over the course of this press conference, um, and it was addressed to Lavrov, and it says this, the collective West is using aggressive dual deterrence methods against Russia and China to prevent their progress and to hinder the implementation of their sovereign policies. Are you and your Chinese partners considering dual deterrence response measures, what could they be? And then Lavrov responded, I won't give away a secret if I say the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi came up with a formula of double counteraction to double deterrence yesterday. Double counteraction to double deterrence. looks like the Chinese and the Russians are coordinating and they're going to work together to counteract so-called deterrence of them both by the Western powers and that there will be double counteraction by the two of them jointly in response. It may not be a coincidence, by the way, that the Chinese Foreign Ministry is highlighting a meeting between Chinese and Russian Deputy Foreign Ministers, which is overtly said to be about coordinating positions in the UN Security Council and in other international formats. Anyway, that was a most interesting comment by Lavrov. And notice, however, that the um, formula double counteraction to double deterrence, Lavrov attributes to Wang Yi, and he's clearly been given the green light by Wang Yi to disclose it. He says, after all, I won't give away a secret if I say that Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi came up with the formula of double counteraction to double deterrence yesterday. Anyway, the Chinese have not, as I said, provided, um, have not provided readouts in English yet of these conversations, but they have provided extensive commentaries of um, uh, concerning Lavrov's visit, his meeting with Xi Jinping especially, but also, of course, with Wang Yi. And um, we're told that over the course of the press conference, Wang Yi mentioned five always at the press conference. Uh, for example, he said that the two countries should always follow the strategic guidance of head of state diplomacy, head of state diplomacy, should always adhere to the principle of no alliance, no confrontation, and no targeting of at any third party, should always stay on the right course on major matters of principle, uh, um, and actively respond to common aspirations and legitimate concerns of the people of all countries, adopt, advocate a new path of state-to-state -state relations featuring dialogue and partnership, and actively promoting the building of a community with a shared future of humanity. Always these very general Chinese phrases, which actually, despite their seeming vagueness, 
clearly chart a profoundly different course from the one followed by the United States and the collective West. Um, and then we have commentaries for in Global Times from people like, like Li Haidong. China and Russia will not target any third parties. But if hegemonic forces threaten China and Russia or threaten world peace, China and Russia will stand together and fight to protect their own interests and safeguard world peace together. And yesterday, there was another long article in Global Times. Um, to repeat, a newspaper ultimately owned by the Chinese, by the communist, by the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Anyway, there was a long article which again reiterated that Chinese Russian economic cooperation is not up for negotiation with the West, that China not only opposes any sanctions based upon Chinese companies and big businesses that engage in the trade with Russia, but that in effect it will retaliate if those sanctions are imposed. And then today there is an immensely confident article by Hu Sitsin in Global Times. Hu Sitsin is a former edit is the former editor of Global Times. He is presumably a figure of great authority, and he says that China is able to balance ties with Russia, US, and Europe. And um, he said that um, how important are China Russia relations to the two countries? They couldn't be more important after the outbreak of Russia-Ukraine conflict. The West imposed harsh sanctions on Russia. However, trade between China and Russia reached a record $240 billion in 2023, with Russia, Chinese exports to Russia growing by 46.9% and imports from Russia rising by 13%. The Russian economy actually grew by 3.6% in 2023, despite the war which would have been much more difficult without the trade with China, which is, of course, true. And um, he then goes on to say, who then goes on to say, some say that China would be better off if the US replaced Russia. But due to a variety of structural reasons, especially after the United States has identified China as its largest strategic competitor, Washington is seen in China as unapproachable. China can only focus on easing relations with the United States, but cannot make the US a partner like Russia. In fact, the back-to-back -back China Russia relationship is precisely one of the factors that the US is wary of in its attitude towards China. In other words, what Hu is saying is that the relationship between China and Russia is actually giving China leverage over the United States. And this takes us back to those commentaries that appeared earlier this week in Global Times, in which they said that the United States is effectively trapped in Ukraine and in the Middle East, and that gives that means that it's not really in a position to confront China in Taiwan and the South China Sea. And for that reason, China, in a sense, in his is in fact actually in a stronger position. The West might tell itself that the China-Russian relationship has become a problem for China, but that always assumes that the Chinese 
are far more focused on maintaining good relations with the United States and the Western powers. In fact, the relations with the United States and the Western powers are so economically vital to China that in any kind of global conflict, it will axiomatically sacrifice its relations with Russia in order to keep those economic relations with the United States and the collective West stable. But in reality, the Chinese see things quite differently. They are increasingly confident that their economic relationship with the West, that in the economic relationship with the West, it is they who have the stronger position and the West which has the weaker position. And with the Russians keeping the Americans trapped and distracted in Ukraine, support for, Ch for Russia by China simply increases China's leverage. And who actually goes on to discuss this? He says, according to media reports, during Ger German Chancellor Scholz's upcoming visit to China, he will be accompanied by top German CEOs of companies such as Mercedes-Benz and Siemens. Most Europeans are not willing to see Atlanticism hinder Europe-China cooperation or cooperate with the US in getting tough with on China. The West is scattered in front of China. There is a big gap between the US and Europe with differences within Europe. There is a lot of room for China to deal with, in it, with its relations with the United States and Europe, and its relations with Russia will definitely not become an obstacle. And um, the Chinese people feel that the kind of demands that Yellen made were very normal, and overall, China is well positioned to forge strong relations with Russia, whilst at the same time providing, these are whose words again, effective strategic management of its relations with the US and Europe. So, the Chinese feel themselves in a strong position. And I think the economic data partly explains why. I spoke yesterday in my program how Western commentary about China is all over the place, talking about a crisis in the Chinese economy, the American credit rating agents, Chinese economy, the American credit rating agencies, by the way, have now rushed to downgrade China, consistent with that story. And at the same time, Yellen going to China, complaining about Chinese overcapacity, about the prowess of Chinese manufacturing, about how another shock from China would not be acceptable to the United States, and um, how you know the modernity and automation of the Chinese industrial economy, manufacturing economy, is now an overwhelming and overwhelming and, and dangerous challenge for the West. So the Chinese, having made the strategic decision some years ago to bring their um, real estate market under control to transfer investment, overinvestment from real estate back towards manufacturing, doing what people like Professor Sachs, Jeffrey Sachs, and Professor Michael Hudson say they should be doing, to focus on the productive side of their economy rather than its asset side, completely contrary to what economic orthodoxy in the West dictates. The Chinese feeling that as these investments in that productive side are bearing fruit, the Chinese feeling increasingly confident, the Western powers increasingly nervous about Chinese actions, the Chinese are feeling more and more confident 
they feel that the Russians are doing their work for them in Ukraine. That China is backing the winning side and that it is an eventually going to reap the rewards. The meeting between Xi Jinping and Putin, when it happens, probably next month, will be very interesting indeed. Well, this is where I end my programme today. More from me soon. Let me say again that um, you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. Don't forget that you can also check our... Um, um, you can also uh, support our work by Patreon subscribe, subscribe star. You can check out our shop where you can find all sorts of amazing things, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.